Hi, Victoria. How are you? Good, thank you. Hi, Katarina. Hi, everyone. Thanks for coming. We'll start in around 10 minutes. So, thank you. Hi Z, hi Simone. We'll start in around nine minutes. Thank you for coming. Nice seeing you here. Hi Joyce, how are you? Hi, I'm hey, everyone. Good, doing good, thanks. Hi Serena, how are you today? Hello. Good, how are you? How is everyone? Good, thank you. Yeah, hi Serena, Victoria, and everyone else. Hi Joyce. We'll start in around seven minutes. Welcome everyone. Thanks for coming. Thanks for being patient with us.
Hey Joyce, hey Serena. Sorry I was busy before. Hello, how's it going? Going well, thank you. I'm just making some dinner. Nice to see friends in the audience. Debbie and Omar and Hector, Emilia, Brian, and Z. I'm making dinner and I burnt it, so I'm making it over. <laughs> they have to be truthful. <laughs> What, what's for dinner? Um, well, I was sauteing some red peppers and onions. Mm. And uh, I went to check some email. <laughs> <laughs> You're so much better than me. I just scrap off whatever was burned and then give everyone <laughs> uh, I'm, so, it's I'm so scared of that part you know i've heard so many times that we're not supposed to eat blackened things so so i'm just obsessive about scraping that part off hi tutu uh, i hope i say your name right um how are you thank you for coming hi Hi. Yeah. Um, thank you. Yeah, thank you for inviting. Now it works. Your mic <laughs> okay. works. This is fantastic. Hello, Choo Choo. Hi. Hello. Hi. Yeah, we're so glad you're here. Uh, thank you for doing this, coming to Clubhouse to speak with us here today. We are really honored. Thank you. Yeah, yeah this is uh, fun. I, I'm looking forward to it. Yeah, so uh, in order for everyone to be really into this talk, please turn around 20 times in each direction <laughs> until you're nauseated. <laughs> don't do that, please don't. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> because this is an interactive talk. <laughs> yeah. No, just kidding. Um, Appreciate you. <laughs> uh, Chichu, we'll start in around three minutes, if that's okay with you. Um, we'll wait a little bit until people have time to arrive, and yeah, and we we'll go from there. Yeah, sounds good. Sounds good. We're joking about nausea, but it's you know I think that. Um, our bodies forget pain while we're, you know, after the experience, but then when you experience it again, you remember really well. And somehow nausea is just as debilitating as pain. And the times that I've experienced nausea beyond the flu, um, I'm thinking my first experience with extended nausea was when I was pregnant with my first child and it was months of nausea. It was debilitating, demoralizing. I didn't know how I was going to make it through the day. And I'm, I'm so interested in this topic because of that, because it, you know, we experience hardship and it, I think it makes us more, it, it, it increases our compassion for what other people are suffering. So I knew that my nausea had, um, you know, an end date, but for people who don't and have it for different reasons, um, my heart goes out to them, so I'm grateful for your research. Yeah, me too. I I rather I'm rather in pain than nauseated. Like it's the worst. I had the same with my pregnancy. It's like so nauseated. I couldn't keep anything, and not even water at some point. So I had to get um, transfusions every couple of days, and it's just horrible. <laughs> can do anything so yeah I, I really appreciate your work <laughs> yeah thank you um i i agree like pregnancy in this nausea is so prevalent every woman or most women may experience it but we actually don't know much about about that at all so um, i'm surprised but uh, hopefully we can address some of the questions and in the current or future work so yeah well, it doesn't surprise me that a, not a lot is known about it, um, in, according to medical science anyway. Maybe um, 
traditional wisdom would have a lot to say about it. I just, I know that I've read that it's that uh, Quranic gonadotropin is responsible that the more of it that you show in your blood, the higher probability that you will experience nausea, which can indicate just a healthy pregnancy, but about the mechanism, mm. or just that it, it can create a very sensitive stomach lining. But even that, why does that go toward nausea? And I'm sorry, Katarina. Yeah, I was threatened with the same, but I discovered watermelon. So now I have to say to any anyone, if you're having trouble keeping water down, then try watermelon. Well, that's an interesting one. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it kept me out of the hospital. Hmm. I love watermelon too. Yes, and now you can buy personal watermelons. <laughs> personal ones. <laughs> yeah, that's what they call them at the market. Little oh. ones, they're fully ripe, but they call them personal watermelons. <laughs> Do they have personal kiwis? Yes. <laughs> Okay, I think we can slowly start and then, um, yeah, and go from there. So welcome everyone to Science Society. And of course, a special uh, warm welcome to you, uh, Chuchu. We are very uh, thankful that you um, came here today to share your really interesting and also very important research. Um, um, so before we start, let me give everyone a short introduction so they get to know you a little bit. Uh, Dr. Tutsu Tseng, she's a research fellow in cell biology at Harvard Medical School. And um, she, um, she did her PhD in neuroscience at the University of California in San Francisco. And she did her bachelor's in biochemistry at the Hong Kong University of Science and Technology. And um, she is, um, as a neuroscientist, she's really interested in understanding how organisms detect and process different types of sensory stimuli at the secret and molecular level. And she's currently in Stephen Libero's lab at Harvard and there she wants to investigate how sensory signals from the gut are processed in the brainstem. And um, yeah, that's what we um, are learning here today. But before we start, um, Victoria usually asks a couple of interview questions, if that's okay with you. And, and then we go into your talk about your research. Thank you. Yeah, sure. All right, thank you so much, Chuchu. Thank you, Katarina. Chuchu, we want to make the most of your time here. And so to learn a little bit more about you before we hear about your research, my question is if you can think back in your childhood or early life and consider when you might have noticed that you had a special connection to science. That could be through an event or a person or an experience. Yeah, so uh, my father is a scientist and so I grew up in a university campus pretty much and I often go to his lab when I was a child and so for me it's always uh, kind of part of my life. And then um, when I went to college I, of course, thought about this kind of uh, uh, research life, so, so I tried it. I, I joined a research lab to, to be like a summer student. And then, and then I think I really connect with the people in the lab. I think my mentor, also the people that I work with, they're just really fun, smart people. And, and I really like being with these people. So um, I think perhaps it's the people and of course the, the exciting science that really connect me with this um, path. So I basically decided to pursue um, a you know, PhD, then I can keep doing what I like to do. So this is just uh, you know, how it started for me. 
Thank you very much. That is really interesting that that the roots of that began in your father's lab. And and so were you were you listening or were you was this uh, was this lecture or you were observing him with research or or manipulating data or what types of um, lab activities were you witness to? Yeah, so he does different things. He's a material scientist. So I go to his uh, research lab where there are some like super hot ovens that they make uh, certain materials that I actually don't quite understand. Um, I just kind of see it. I see the people in the lab doing stuff. I, I don't understand. I basically just like observes. Um, and then, yes, sometimes, you know, my father took me out of daycare, like after my daycare finished, he basically took me to the lab because he still had to finish it up. So I basically just sit there, watch what people were doing and then go home. So uh, yeah, I, I never go to his lectures. Does that too much? <laughs> You just got the fun part. That sounds so fun. You got the best field trip ever. And it was your dad. So that no, hooray for him. That's that's really beautiful. And and then can you take us up to your current research? What what um, events, maybe just a, a broad overview or brief overview of what led to the current research that you'll be presenting this evening? Yeah, sure. So um... I've always been interested in sensory neuroscience. So, you know, as an undergrad and then graduate school, I always studied like sensory uh, processing. So when I was a grad student, I work in pain. And I think some of you <laughs> mentioned about like how terrible pains are. And um, so that's what I study as a grad student. So I basically identify pain producing animal toxins from snakes or centipedes or scorpions and use them to elucidate mechanisms of pain. And, and after I finished uh, working on my project, I started to think about, um, like, so pain basically is a uh, sensory neuron detecting external dangers such as toxins. So what about um, toxins that are ingested, so internal toxins? And this happens a lot when we ingest uh, pathogens and cause uh, food poisoning and nausea and vomiting. And then I start to think that like nausea and it's, it's a very similar protective sensory mechanisms to avoid dangers, but not much is known at all um, about nausea. So then I um, joined my current uh, postdoc lab who is uh, study the internal sensations and um, we use a lot of uh, current neuroscience techniques to study um, how bodies detect internal um, stimuli, such as you know ingesting toxins like stomach pain, these kind of things. So that's kind of how I get to um, get to the nausea field. Right. Thank you. Yes, it is, it is so fascinating that that we have those the unpleasant feelings of nausea and pain and. Yeah, everything that we just said, <laughs> going back to our, our just discussion about how debilitating that can be and and what is the protective mechanism, what, what could those possibly be. So at this point, you're welcome to go into your body of your discussion and we can have a Q&A following or we can have the Q&A drive your discussion along either way. And sometimes friends will put questions or comments in the chat and we on stage will take care of that for you so you don't have to worry about it and we'll share that with you. So um, we can run this however you'd like and the floor is yours. And thank you, Chi Chi. Yeah, so um, I think I will talk about our two recent studies um, as they're closely connected. I will talk about the main takeaways in each study and then I can open up for questions. And of course, you can always interrupt me during the, the, the talk uh, for any questions or clarifications. So, um, so nausea is a sensation of visceral malaise frequently associated with vomiting. At some point, everyone experiences nausea, whether it's from food poisoning or it's through uh, infection. Nausea and uh, vomiting is 
evolutionarily conserved protective mechanisms to get rid of ingested toxins and also learn um, to avoid the ingested toxins for the future. Most of the time, it's only temporary, but for some people, such as those on chemotherapy treatments, nausea can be severe, chronic, and even life-threatening when it prevents treatments and causes dangerous dehydration. The sensory pathways leading to nausea have remained largely mysterious, and particularly at the molecular and genetic level. So this led to our first study that we want to identify and characterize neurons that regulate nausea-like responses in mice. We started focus on a brain structure called the air postremum. It's located in the brain stem. The air postrema is long been uh, associated with vomiting and is one of the rare parts of the brain that's outside the blood-brain barrier that can protect the brain from the exposure uh, to blood-bone toxins. So um, for long, people thought that the air postrema uh, role is to uh, is, is a alarm bell for dangers. So there are different cell types and uh, receptors expressed in the air postrema, but we don't really know uh, what they are. So to start, we build an atlas of cell types by characterizing gene expressions in the thousands of individual neurons in the air postrema from mice. So this is by a technique called single nucleus RNA sequencing. The idea is that different cells playing different roles will express different genes. And based on how similar the function, uh, functional gene expressions are, we can um, group cells. And supposedly, each group will be doing something different from one another. So for example, excitatory neurons and inhibitory neurons are separate groups because one elicits excitatory responses while the other elicits uh, inhibitory responses. This is a well-established technique in recent years by many research groups. So what we found is that there are only a handful of different excitatory and inhibitory neuron types in the air postrema. Of particular interest were excitatory neurons that express glucagon-like peptide-1 receptors, or GLP-1R. It's a receptor on the cell surface that has linked to blood sugar and appetite control. In fact, Agonist for GLP-1R is the main thing for diabetes treatment, but induces nausea as a major side effect. To probe if these neurons play a role in nausea, we used a conditioned flavor avoidance behavioral test in mice, as mice don't vomit unlike human. We add cherry or grape flavor to the animal's drinking water, and then gave the mice either a innocuous substance or one known to induce nausea. If a mice feels malaise, it will quickly associate a fruit flavor with the negative sensation and avoid it in the future, similar to that you would avoid a specific food that makes you throw up. We tested uh, many different substances, including gut irritant, lithium chloride, bacterial lipopolysaccharide associated with food poisoning, diabetes drug, glp one agonist, and cancer chemotherapy drug, cisplatin. As expected, all tested substances will lead to a strong flavor aversion in mice. When the air postrema glp one neurons were experimentally removed with a genetic approach, mice stopped developing flavor aversions for most of the substances suggesting that they no longer experienced malaise as normal. We also experimentally turned on the air postrema GLP-1R neurons using a technique that essentially tricked them to think that there was a toxin present. Mice with activated GLP-1R neurons would acquire strong flavor aversions even when they were never exposed to a nausea-inducing substance. So, both loss of function and gain of function of these neurons and observations that we saw suggest a connection between these neurons and the nausea responses. There are some other things that we also discovered. The air postrema GLP-1 neurons can be further divided into smaller subsets. 
One subset expressed a receptor for the stress response cytokine, GDF15. And interestingly, silencing this subset of neurons would cause the mice to stop developing flavor aversion for only the lithium chloride induced uh, aversion, indicating there's potential a division of labor between different air postumal neurons with uh, different neurotypes responsible for different alarm signals uh, uh, for like ingested toxins. We also mapped neuronal connections of the air postumal glp neurons in the brain. These neurons connect to many other regions of the brain, including one called the parabarchial nucleus, which has been recognized as a sensory hub for pain and aversion. So this may be how the air postumal neurons help induce conditioned aversion memories. So this is the brief uh, sum up of the first study. And what inspired our second study is that when we mapped the air post neuronal connections, we also look at the air post inhibitory neurons. These neurons surprisingly only project locally within the air post forming a dense network that connects to the nearby excitatory neurons. So we thought, maybe the inhibitory neurons can stop the excitatory neurons that produces nausea. Indeed, when we activated these inhibitory neurons, mice lacked nausea-like behaviors that are typically caused by excitatory neurons. In our previous sequencing results, we also identified uh, three types of inhibitory neurons in the air post -trima. One of these types expressed a receptor for GIP, which is a gut hormone released after eating that stimulates the release of insulin uh, to control blood sugar. We were curious whether this population of inhibitory neurons could um, be manipulated to suppress nausea behaviors, and if so, how does it work? When we used GIP to activate these inhibitory neurons, the inhibitory currents prompted by the neural messenger um, GI GABA flow to nearby excitatory neurons, which then uh, and actually, interestingly, to specifically to one subset of the excitatory neurons marked by the GDF15 receptor that induces nausea, and then reduce the overall activity of these neurons. On a behavioral level, we give mice flavored water again, followed by injection of nausea-inducing substance, and the animals will begin to avoid the flavored water. But if mice receive GIP, the rodents will happy to drink the flavored water. But if we bred, uh, bred the mice that lack the inhibitory neurons in the air post giving GIP to the mice will make no difference. The animals will continue to drink, uh, uh, avoid the flavored water. So GIP indeed suppress nausea-like behaviors and it acts through the air post inhibitory neurons. So GIP has already been studied as a potential treatment for nausea, but people don't understand why. And our study basically suggests that it's through the air post inhibitory neurons. And for those other studies, they have actually shown that GIP, when given to animals that do vomit, including ferrets, dogs, and shrews, it can reduce nausea in several nausea models, such as chemo cancer chemotherapy-induced nausea, and, um, and some other uh, conditions. And there are also people working on incorporating GIP into diabetes treatment that target the GLP-1R receptors with the goal of e uh, reducing nausea as a side effect. So the traditional approach to intervene nausea is to block signaling pathways using pharmacological inhibitors. But we here focus on a new strategy of using the inhibitory neurons that suppress the excitatory neurons in the air post -trima. By identifying the inhibitory neurons that suppress nausea in a pharmacological, uh, pharmacologically accessible way, we can simply engage this neuron to counteract the nausea responses. So this is the main uh, takeaway of, of the paper. And um, I, there's a lot of interesting questions that uh, I think opened up. And um, I 
am currently actually searching for faculty positions where I can establish my own research groups to study nausea. And I hope to uh, study some of the interesting questions that I, um, that I will be uh, discussing. For example, one I'm really interested is to understand the way the gut communicate with the neurons uh, in the airpostrema. So the airpostrema excitatory and inhibitory neurons are connected to the gut through the vagus nerve. But how those brain cells are controlled by gut-derived signals are unknown. Obviously, we know that when something goes wrong in the gut, you can induce nausea. But how does that work? And maybe some of these mechanisms are conserved in uh, certain gastrointestinal disorders, such as uh, food allergy. And another question I'm also very interested in is to uncover the potential different signaling factors that contribute to nausea. For example, food poisoning potentially engages uh, signal molecules and cells very distinct from cancer chemotherapy or pregnancy-induced nausea. I'm particularly interested in many of the pathological conditions that induce nausea without the presence of even a foreign substance, such as during uh, radiation exposure, pregnancy, and, and migraine. So nausea and vomiting in these conditions no longer serve as a protective reflex, but become a prolonged symptom that reduce the quality of life. The mechanisms behind this sort of maladaptive nausea conditions are complete mysteries. Presumably, our own cells within the body start to secrete sensory cues that stimulate nausea responses. So what are those signal cues? What cells generate these uh, maladaptive signals? And how are the signals detected um, by you know, what cells? So we want to know more about the various nausea mechanisms so that we can develop even better treatment strategies that can tailor to specific conditions. So um, to that, from, uh, and from there, I think I can open up to questions. Yeah, thank you so much for giving us an overview of your really interesting research here. And um, yeah, I, I agree that your research opens up a lot of questions like every really great research project does. <laughs> it just opens up basically a new new field almost that you can you probably have material for three professor <laughs> like assistant professor positions like PI positions so um, and we wish you all the luck of course um, for that and that you find the perfect place for you okay so going into questions um, I really so are you maybe currently working on maybe dissecting out also if um, so you talked about vulnerabilities right um, but before that um, do you are also like maybe some receptors GABA receptors also involved like is there any data that just blocking like using maybe epilepsy drugs could um, also um, you know since since um, inhibitory neurons are also involved could could that be like an immediate target that one could use also for nausea suppression maybe um, yeah so I think use the generic GABAergic receptor um, manipulation could be difficult because they're too non-specific and um, there are it could have multiple other effects and um, so I think the idea is that we now know that those, these inhibitory neurons um, could potentially uh, suppress nausea on the circuit level. So we can look at what receptors these cells express. For example, they're often GPCRs or receptors that we have uh, known targets. And we can manipulate those neurons much more specifically with those receptors. And I think this might be a, I mean, this may have already been a strategy, a strategy um, uh, utilized by, uh, by companies to, to, to develop new 
anti-nausea drugs. So I think um, also, you know, in a way we can also look at excited neurons in the apical stroma. What receptors do they express? And we, in our paper, we actually show that by looking at the receptors in the excited neurons that produce nausea, we can actually um, test. And indeed, those signaling pathways engaging excited neurons induce similar effects like GLP-1 agonists, like GDF-15 uh, receptor. So basically, it's very powerful to actually just look at the gene expressions and look into you know, the signal mechanism engaged by different subtypes of the neurons and develop better pharmacological uh, tools. Um, so, so you, the the brain cells um, that you discovered are they responsible also for like vomit inducing type of behavior and so you know contractions in the stomach and things like that? Um, like, did you measure? Um, this type of um, control or motor control or so in the animal? Yeah, great question. So yes, I measured physiological changes including uh, breathing, heart rate, gastrointestinal, uh, per gas actual gastric pressure, uh, so pressure within the stomach. And when we um, activate these neurons, we observe a increase of gastric pressure. So basically stomach contraction and a uh, decrease of phasic pressure. So we know that stomach contract at a regular pace. When we activate these neurons, basically the regular contraction would decrease. And this, are, this is indeed consistent with um, when we feel nausea and feel stomach malaise. However, um, it's a little tricky because mice don't have a vomiting reflex. So it's very hard to uh, say, you know, this is similar to nausea, because, uh, vomiting, because they don't have vomiting reflex. But um, I think you're asking a great question because it's in, very important to measure in a vomiting animal model what happens if we manipulate these neurons. And in, actually, in, uh, there are some research group that actually did use uh, vomiting models and I think uh, in my future lab, I would also like to incorporate that into my own research and to, to see what happens if, when we manipulate these neurons. Yeah, that's very important. Thank you for, for that. Um, because, you know, it's more personal. I have um, close um, family and friends in North Portugal. Um, there's a high occurrence of ALS, like a specific types of ALS and also muscle dystrophy. And a big problem is nausea and kind of vomiting inducing. Um, and, you know, it would be really interesting if maybe by inhibiting that brain region, um, if you could basically uh, reduce those relatively early onset symptoms so yeah so if you would one day also study muscle dystrophy uh, animals that would be really really interesting thank you i don't know if you said this if i might have missed it but do you think this might also be involved in the nausea that occurs with migraines sometimes it's even without the pain of the head basically but it's kind of an abdominal migraine and I've had a few migraines in the past where the nausea was the worst thing. <laughs> Thanks, I'm done. I'm, I'm sorry to hear that. Um, so I, I mean, honestly, I don't know, but I think it will be very, very interesting to look into, uh, into that. Uh, migraine, the, I mean, there's still a lot unknown about what causes migraine. So. Um, and the animal model for studying migraine is also very difficult because uh, uh, you can't ask a mice whether they're experiencing migraine. So, um, but there are quite a lot of uh, research groups working on migraine and we're, I mean, in the future, I would definitely like to um, join force with people uh, who are expert in migraine and look into that. I, you know, just 
kind of thinking about you know migraine some people uh, there's studies suggest that CGRP is uh, really is uh, very important for migraine uh, mechanisms and I wonder you know if some of this kind of signaling uh, molecules also can be detected by these neurons um, currently I don't know but I think it's a very great uh, future questions I was also thinking of the connection with the gut because um, quite a few people report having foods apparently triggering their migraines. And I know there's some ideas about mechanisms, but I don't think it's all explained what the mechanisms are. Anyway, I'm done. Well, very, uh, very interesting. I have not heard of that, but this is uh, super interesting to uh, look into. Mm. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm curious about, um, so a, a couple of questions in, in terms of um, getting to human trials or, you know, at least looking at the fidelity of the mouse model in extrapolating to humans. Um, has there been much work on that? And is it is it a really good model in the sense that um, we can sort of design very specific uh, therapies? So I think the question is whether mouse model is a good model for studying nausea. Um, I think it's always, it's not perfect. For sure, mm. it's not perfect. I think you always need to have a role-meeting model to um, validate, so, such as um, ferrets. It's a very common uh, role-meeting model used by uh, preclinical studies. And, um, the this assay that we do called condition flavor avoidance assay is suggestive of nausea, but it's not definitive, and um, you do need an, a vomiting model to to do it. So most of the um, translational work I seen is to do mice and then do um, ferret models, and then we can move on to human trials. And I I wonder if. Um... Is there an indication that it, the effects of the malaise and the just awful feeling is somehow separable from uh, the vomit reflex in the sense that, um, you know, in the cases of food poisoning or something, you know, where you really need to get it out uh, versus, you know, okay, can we damp the malaise and, and, and still have the, the signal that, you know, something's wrong? But it's just just not so awful. Um, yeah, so that's also a great question whether um, malaise or nausea and uh, vomiting can be separated. In a way, I would. So um, there's suggestions that it it indeed can be separated because a lot of the uh, drugs, current anti-emetic drugs, are relatively efficient in. Um, well, they're, they're not very good, first of all, but some of them are more efficient at pr pr um, stopping, stop vomiting, but not really treating nausea. So people think that maybe those drugs uh, targeted the vomiting region, but not really suppressing the sensation. Um, I think the, um, the, the vomiting is a motor reflex, so anything that uh, so you need a so basically sensory cells detecting um, signals and then you will go to think some interneurons and those interneurons will eventually go to the motor neurons to trigger the motor reflex and the sensory neurons will also send information to the higher brain regions to cause malaise and learned aversion so the airport stream neurons that we studied are these kind of sensory neurons that can both send information to the higher brain to condition aversion, but also send information directly to motor neurons to cause different sort of uh, reflexes, such as the GI contractions that we measured. So um, I think you can, you can target different pathways, uh, outputs from these neurons to sort of separate them. Um, I guess, so that's my... Um, Answers to your question. 
there's been some times with food poisoning, it, it would have been nice for someone to just come in with a gamma knife and just... <laughs> It, are there regions of neurons that might be, um, you said it was the same neurons that are sending the signals to the brain as they are to the motor neurons. If there wasn't a subpopulation that was identified that could be targeted? Uh, we don't know. Uh, we don't know. Yeah. So um, even though we know the cells can directly send motor outputs to control, uh, you know, stomach contraction, we believe those motor neurons could also be modulated by surrounding interneurons as the brainstem is composed of other nucleus. So there might be a unidentified population of, of, of interneurons that could modulate the uh, reflex itself. Yeah, I think it's, to it's, it's, it's very likely, um, but we haven't, uh, yeah, we haven't done that. Thank you, fascinating. Yeah, thank you so much for, uh, you know, fascinating work that you just shared with us. As you mentioned that one of the side effects after receiving the chemotherapy for the patient is the nausea. And uh, you might know that uh, with the immunotherapy somehow, especially using of the, I mean, checkpoint inhibitor, uh, solve this problem. However, because you just mentioned about the GLP, uh, GLP-1, I was just wondering if you want to use this mechanism, uh, what about, uh, you know, um, some of the patients that they are suffering from the pancreatic cancer? Is that possible that reversely you exacerbate the situation with developing the drug or such things based upon your research or not? Uh, that's a great point. Um, I think we have not looked at um, like pancreatic cancer model in combination with uh, of this uh, GIP drug. And I think to think about the translation of potential of using GIP to treat cancer chemotherapy induced nausea, it definitely have to be more um, well-rounded to think about other potential issues like you, the one that you raised. I would think that at this point, GIP is more um, thought of a potential target for treating diabetes uh, or uh, diabetes drugs induced nausea. And because it actually worked together with GLP-1R agonists to actually increase the, um, the efficacy of, of uh, blood glucose lowering and as well as uh, weight loss, increased weight loss. So for, for that application, I think it's, it's very promising. Um, yeah, but like you said, for other nausea conditions, this may not be the perfect drug. And, um, and this is also promotes one of my uh, research goals, which is to study uh, even more um, broadly what signaling mechanisms are involved in different conditions, such as cancer chemotherapy. Can we even have a better target than just uh, you know, blocking with GIP recept the GIP receptors or activating GIPR, um, yeah. Also, do you have any thoughts around the plasma instability that it can happen because of the using the substances or somehow chemotherapy or such things? I was wondering, knowing your thoughts around that. Um, so, sorry, ma'am, uh, if I understand your question correctly, is the stability of the, plasma? the GIP? Plas uh, yes, plasma uh, instability. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, that's uh, so GIP and like you said, GIP and GLP one. They're both very unstable. They're gut peptides that are secreted and potentially acted relatively locally, and they don't really uh, circulate that easily. Um, but I think we think that in certain conditions where there is potential large secretions, maybe they could actually target the cells in the air streamer. But we also have to consider the pharmacological or, or ther ther therapeutical use of these drugs. Usually people choose to use a stable analog of GIP or stable analog of GLP-1. So uh, they actually stay quite long in the, uh, in the circulation. And this is actually what we use in our study as well.
Thank you. Um, hi, Sterling. How are you? Uh, did you want to ask a question? And Denise, did you want to ask a question? Sorry, I... Okay. okay. I'll go after Sterling. Okay, thank you. Okay. Thank you. Uh, great talk, great paper. I actually saw this on Twitter, like, when it came out. So it's cool to just get invited here. Um, so just briefly, my area that I work in a lot is in vagus nerve stimulation through uh, like cervical stimulation through uh, ultrasound. So sonogenetic kind of stimulation work. And uh, there was a question like Serena had asked about, I think which a couple questions about migraines related to these kind of networks. And um, there are existing uh, tools available on the market that do stimulate the vagus nerve through electrical stimulation called the gamma core. Uh, that's from a co company called Electrocore. So there are uh, migraine based treatments that may also, you know, stimulate the same network uh, in the, in the AP and the vagus nerve. Um, I was curious for, uh, for the speaker today. Um, what, what kind of, um, so you did optogenetic stimulation have you tried, I guess, what what kind of experience do you have with like direct vagal stimulation? If you, could you have gotten the same effects if you did like the, if you stimulated the no-dose ganglion? Like how far out of the area for strama did you, did you try optogenetic stimulation to try and elucidate or elucidate that network? Did you go any further out of there with your work? So, um... Uh, first of all, I have not stimulated nodos and look at um, the sort of behaviors. But I think there's a couple of things. Um, our lab studies the vagus nerve, and we have the lab has discovered that the vagus nerve is composed of the genetically um, and uh, functionally different subsets. Some vagal neurons uh, mediates, um, uh, detects a stomach. Uh, a, a stomach stretch, some detect stomach hormones, some detect lung inflation, some detect heart rate. So they're all different rows collect, uh, collectively together into those uh, nodules. When you stimulate the nodules all together, it's sort of, um, it's, there's not too much specificity. And um, so, so that's, that's the reason that I don't do this kind of study. However, I do find that there are specific uh, vagal types that do project to the air post -trima. and but we don't know what those neurons uh, do. Do those neurons innovate the stomach or innovate the duodenum uh, in, the, in the intestine or the colon of the intestine? We don't know. And if you stimulate those neurons specifically instead of the whole um, you know, vagal nerve, maybe you could actually get the same sort of aversion, like nausea-like responses. So, uh, well, and, and if you stimulate like everything together, some of the effect can be potentially masked by this, those some of these other very strong effects, such as heart rate uh, or like breathing, stop breathing. So, so I think it's a little bit difficult to to stimulate the uh, the, the the nerve um, in in our ex in experimental um, uh, conditions. Yeah. Cool. Thank you. Yeah, that, that answers my question. Go ahead. So I had a I had a sort of more basic question. There are some psychologists which assert that pain can be thought away. What What do you think about that? Uh, so it's a question that. Nausea can also be uh, thought away. <laughs> so I so that's a question of how do nausea uh, or or those neurons that we discovered may be modulated by higher brain inputs, and and uh, I think that's a very interesting direction as well. I did not mention that, but I think those neurons also receive inputs from higher brain areas, and you know if you. Uh, in your own experience, maybe you, you, you meditate, you, you can kind of suppress your nausea to somewhat. Or if you see something super disturbing, you can feel nausea sometimes too. So definitely, you can uh, use the higher brain, um, like 
to, to, to either invoke or suppress nausea. So what are those neuron pathways? We don't know. Um, so we can potentially trace neurons from where what we have discovered to the higher brains and see you know, what kind of inputs do they receive and kind of maybe go into that uh, question a bit more. But at this moment, we have not um, done that. Yeah, it's very interesting. What, what would it take to, to do that? So um, it's, it's not tricky, actually. It's, it's, it's potentially uh, a quick uh, um, uh, one-step experiment. So viral tracing is very commonly used in neuroscience. And basically, you just need a, a virus that can trace backwards to, um, you know, to, to identify the inputs of those uh, nausea-inducing neurons. And, um, and then another potential uh, way is to look at the inhibitor, the inhibitor neurons that were discovered. One potential um, way that we may suppress nausea is by activating the inhibitor neurons, right? So maybe those inhibitor neurons in, in receive higher brain inputs. That's how it suppresses the nausea. So um, yeah, we just need to carry out some uh, tracing experiments. Fascinating. <laughs> that, I'll, I, I'll, be, I'll be very interested to read those findings when they do come out. Can I jump in real quick? I just want to, can I, I, I think this is fascinating. That's a great question, Denise. Um, that one area that I've been hearing a lot about is the insular cortex and how it has a direct projection to the area of the strama and the, uh, the PAG, um, the periaqueductal gray. And that area in the insula does have projections back and forth between the prefrontal cortex and then the immune system and uh, branches of the vagus nerve. So you can have insula like it, it invokes emotion and thoughts and memories. And so I could see that, it, yeah, I don't know what exact neuronal, neuronal networks there would be, but I think that there could be something to that for sure. Obviously it'd be hard to, uh, to do that research in a, you know, in a fly brain or, but maybe with mice you could condition like, some trauma response and then try to evoke different kinds of memories that could suppress that network just an idea just because that i wanted to throw that out there it's a great question thank you yeah great comments from uh um, sterling i i if if i were to bet where that could be i'd probably bet it's the insulin cortex um you know if i trace back the air posterior neurons so and i think yeah if I would to do this project, I would pop up starting with a mice mo genetic model um, to trace back those nausea uh, inducing and suppressing neurons in the airport streamer to see where, um, where do they receive inputs. And then we can start from there. Yeah, just wanted to mention like in your, um, in your paper, you showed that uh, by using agonists of, um, the GA, DIPR receptor, you could uh, reduce from this cancer drug induced vomiting and, or it was reported before that um, in 2018 that, you know, this cancer drugs, drugs induced vomiting and ferrets could be, um, could be achieved, which is really interesting. How specific are these receptors to these brain regions, or are they quite abundant um, around the brain? Yeah, so the, there are other regions expressing GIP receptors. And for example, in the hypothalamus, where uh, it plays a role in feeding. Um, so, but in our paper, we show that if you ablate the air postrema GIPR neurons, then the um, the malaise or the protective effect of GIP is lost. So even though in other brain regions, they still express GIP receptors, those are probably not responsible for the anti-nausea effect. So um, yeah, so even though it might have broader effects than just anti-nausea, yeah. That's interesting, and you know, um nausea it can induce um ptsd like symptoms in animal models quite easily right it's it's another way of inducing this type of um 
a mechanism of like ingrained memory, like kind of negative labeled ingrained memory. It's very efficient. <clears throat> so um, because Denise asked about, you know, controlling with the mind, basically the nausea. Do you think that insight from PTSD like memories and animals could give insights in how to control nausea like is or do you think that's a very different mechanism um i'm i'm not quite sure if this uh is com is the same mechanism with ptsd like mechanisms uh, i do know that the pain and nausea like um, likely go through a similar pathways through the parabrachial nucleus um, that, uh, and then to the central amygdala to condition the aversion and the, um, the, all the negative memories. So, and this uh, learning pathway could be relearned or it's plastic. So after certain, um, uh, so you, once you, you see the nausea stimulus, but if you don't give the nausea stimulus and kind of conditioned the same flavor, but without uh, the presence of, of the nausea stimulus, mice actually also forget. So they're, they're eventually okay with, with the, the flavored water that we give them. So um, I wonder if this sounds like it's a similar pathway. <laughs> Maybe you, you study that um, PTSD, <laughs> uh, you, you can tell yeah. me more. <laughs> Like um, I yeah I uh, in Joseph Zadu's lab I studied fear memory, but um a friend of mine, Hillary, um, she uh went to Cold Spring Harbor and started actually, um, gustatory memories and you know one way, of having very negative <laughs> gustatory uh mem memories is inducing like nausea inducing like mixing that into the food and then having basically the same type of mechanism just with you know a gustatory input instead of um you know the noise and and, and stuff so it's a it's very effective and very fast mechanism of inducing like uh, negative labeled um memories so yeah, I was just wondering if then the, you know, controlling basically the nausea uh, could, you know, you, what you described is very, basically extinction training. Um, if there are similar, you know, receptors involved, is, is norepinephrine and stuff involved? And if we could basically use that um, stuff to also like control nausea and would be it would just be really interesting if both of those are kind of really similar it and it would make a lot of sense because it's a huge threat right to eat something poisonous and you should learn it fast the same as if like a predator comes and tries to hunt you you have to really learn it fast so uh, it's really important for survival so it makes really sense if there are similar mechanisms involved yeah thank you yeah, yeah, thank you. Uh, makes sense. I will I'll look into that. Yeah. I see Susan. Hi, Susan. How are you today? Do you have a question? Yeah, I, I had to leave, so I'm not sure if you covered it. I have two quick thoughts, and hopefully they would lead to a question. One is, um, if you had not discussed it, the correlation between nausea and motion sickness. And if there was anything in your research there and why some doctors prescribe Benadryl for nausea and why it seems to be so effective. Um, again, this is not my field. So these are just, um, I'm curious about both things. Thank you. Yes, uh, I did not have, I did not talk about motion sickness. Uh, great question to have a chance to discuss that. So motion sickness is thought to be mediated through the inner ear, the vestibular system. Um, it's a completely different sensory pathway. But it has been um, shown, or has, there's some evidence showing that um, the vestibular sensory pathway 
do also converge onto the parabrachial nucleus for the aversive effect, similar to where the Earth's post-trima neurons um, project to. So potentially, these are two different sensory pathways, one detecting blood-borne ingested toxins, one detecting motion. And uh, both pathways can converge onto uh, a nuclear in the midbrain to condition aversion and um, you know, induce nausea. So, and the, the um, antihistamines are used to treat motion sickness because um, the, uh, it has been shown that the vestibular nucleus express the, um, the histamine receptor. So it's more kind of specific to that particular pathway but not for um, the, the, the air post potential of uh, the pathway. Um, just a quick follow-up. Had you read anything about motion sickness and nausea in relation to people that are highly creative being more susceptible to those things? Oh, interesting. Oh, I, I have not heard of it. Yeah. Okay. I've actually read something. If I can, f I find it, I will f send it to you. Okay. Yeah. Uh, okay. Thank you. Thank you for answering. Could I ask real quick, uh, just to jump in on that, the, the comment about Benadryl, uh, that's something that we know in, in, in our work as an anticholinergic. So it, it does seem to block acetylcholine, um, at the side of the receptor. Did you look at, um, cholinergic knockout in any way in this area of in your work? Uh, no. So we look at a bunch of uh, receptors that are common anti-nausea uh, drug targets. And uh, for, for example, uh, serotonin receptors and uh, uh, NK1 receptor and uh, uh, histamine receptors. So um, the airflow streamer is not rich in any of those receptors, it does re express some of acetylcholine receptors, but we have not looked at the uh, um, like knockouts, like you said. But um, but interestingly, airpostrema receives dense uh, vagal inputs, and the vagus nerve is rich in expression of serotonin receptors and K1 receptors. So we think that a lot of the anti nausea drug potentially are inhibiting this vagal airpostrema communication. Um, and that's perhaps how it uh, does, how, how those drugs work at the uh, brainstem level, but we're actually actively testing that, uh, those theories. Yeah. That's interesting. Um, just as a follow-up, I don't want to take up too much time, but a question would be, if you think about the feedback loop, right? So you eat something that makes you sick, the signals go up your vagus nerve into the area of astrema, it detects a certain threshold of activity, and then the area of astrema induces like vomiting, um, by sending signals down through the efferent pathway to induce, you know, the gag reflex and to, to, to vomit. Um, okay, if you take an anti-emetic drug like, um, I don't know, uh, what, I don't know, so if you have any examples of... I on think Yeah, on Dancitron, yeah, exactly. Um, so if you take that, is it that, is it, what is the mechanism where it's actually activating in that feedback loop? Is it, is it simply stopping the vomiting response, or is it more stopping the nausea responses from reaching the area of the stream, or is it is it knocking out both? Wow, you're asking the exact questions that we want to figure out. <laughs> uh, so we, yeah, we don't yeah. So we don't know. So the the drug has been used for so long, and we know it's a serotonin receptor antagonist, but we don't know where it acts and how does it prevent nausea. And um, so we want to. I mean, I want to look into how exactly it works. Like is it stopping the inputs from vagal to air post -trima? so it kind of stopped, in, stopped the whole circuits at the beginning, or it stops the, you know, some of the intermediate levels, the vagal to motor neurons or something. So we, we don't know, yeah. Thank you. I just want to take a moment to pause and reflect on the fact that isn't that interesting? Like it's it's so commonly used, but we don't actually under really understand what's happening. Oh yes, um, the like the nausea whole nausea field. I I feel like there's so many unknowns. The drugs were used, but we don't know how those drugs works, and there's so it's common it's so common, but people just don't know why 
you know, how. So, so I'm, I, I am so excited to study it, but there are just so many questions. <laughs> And, and it also turns out so many drugs have so many different mechanisms of action. It seems like, you know, I've, I've Googled this with regard to a lot of antibiotics, and I found out a lot of antibiotics that are known to be used for bacteria maybe are also antifungal, or they have immunosuppressive effects, or so on and so on. Anyway, I'm done. Yeah, and also another point is that the drugs are not um, perfect. and the drugs work for some people, but not for other people, work for some condition, but not the other condition. So it's, we really need to understand the mechanisms of nausea so that we can actually develop better drugs. And yeah, that's the whole, the goal of the research. Uh, uh, could you, could you elucidate, so based on your optogenetic work, is it how much selectivity do you have in the directionality of blocking effects? So, because you know the AP takes afferent inputs from the stomach uh, through the vagus nerve, so there's afferent nerves that you could probably um, cut off somehow or like selectively, um, you know, turn off, and then you could potentially turn off the mechanisms of AP sending because there's a conscious feeling of feeling sick, right, which is uh, definitely a projection towards the, the conscious mind through the insula to the prefrontal cortex for the, the behavioral changes. Um, how specific do you think you could get in the next few years to knocking out either one direction or the other? Um, so one, we did this experiment to trace whether the, the motor projecting uh, uh, terminals are the same as, are from the same neuron as the higher brain projecting uh, axons. So basically we're tracing at two brain sites, one in the higher brain and one from the, 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 the motor nucleus and going back to the neurons that's, that uh, have the axons and to see whether it's the same neuron or different neurons. And we actually found that most of the are the same neuron so basically, one airport neural neuron will send axons both upstream to the higher brain and downstream to the, to the motor reflex. So it will be very difficult to, you would think that if there are two different neurons populations, then you can kind of selectively block. But if it's the same neuron sending to both pathways, uh, you, well, I, I, I don't know, but um, there might be ways, but we at, at this moment, I couldn't uh, think of a, good way to stop one but not stop another. Interesting. Thank you. Can I ask another quick question? Um, have you looked into the connection, or maybe you covered this already, between nausea and dehydration? Um, so, so dehydration is, I think, um, uh, caused by throwing up too much and you cannot keep anything down and with time then you would would lose lose a lot of the uh, water um, yeah I think uh, the main is it's the fact that you cannot drink or eat and you keep throwing stuff up yeah does that answer your question? Um, yeah, I just am curious, you know, obviously everything you're doing is intent on treatment and helping people. This would be a really great um, way to understand how to help people in this situation, like people that are dealing with like a high fever, obviously during all these pandemics and viruses and um, infections, and then consequently being unable to control their nausea in relation to that would be and sometimes it seems like if you can't control it right away, it's hard to then control. So it's, it would be interesting to know, I guess, futuristically. Right, right. If you know, if you can feel better by taking some pills and you don't feel nausea and you can drink water, you probably, yeah, I think that would be definitely the, the goals, right? For the, um, for anti-nausea treatments, yeah.
are there any so common items that <clears throat> that people might be able to use that are not pharmaceutical i remember when i was young if i had those sorts of problems um, family members would give me mint tea with lemon is there anything else that might help with this nausea state um you know i also have something like that that i do use like for example ginger but i'm not gonna say that any of this um have like scientific base i i, I have not studied that and um and i would like to find some scientific base for some of the common wisdoms um for example ginger people say ginger works but i some people also say it doesn't work so like does ginger uh, the, the the ingredients in the ginger activate some receptors or suppress some receptors in the in the air streamer or the vagus nerve, that so that we actually have a real scientific base behind it. We we actually don't know, but I think it could be studied, you know, in the in the future. Those are some studies I'd like to see. <laughs> yeah, I mean, like what well, like we were just talking about. It's not uh, there's there's not any less evidence based than for some pharmaceutical interventions. <laughs> No one studied it. Yeah. Um, Kyle has a question he wrote me about using, um, you know, cannabis um, for regulation of nausea and vomiting, and it's also prescribed for uh, people with, um, you know, undergoing cancer, cancer treatments. So. Did you in, study that in your work, like what the mechanisms are, why it would help? Yes, so we have not studied it. And I think a cannabinoid receptor um, is like any other anti-nausea drugs. It works, um, but we don't know how it works. But it's also very complex because um, over um, overuse of, of uh, the, um, the weed also causes chronic nausea. So there are receptors, this receptor are expressed in an air postrema, but it's also expressed in the GI tract. Quite, it's quite um, broadly expressed. So how does those um, pass, different neural pathways engage at different dose, at different time, um, and lead to the, the, the effects, you know, either anti-nausea or chronic nausea? It's, it's really not clear. Um, yeah, it's it's a mystery as well. I, I think it deserves a lot of future work on that. Do, do you mean the broad expression as in the CB1 or CB2 or both receptors? I think CB1 receptor. Um, I have to I have to look into my uh, expression of the genes, but I do remember CB1 is broadly expressed in the air postrema. And um, some of my colleagues studied the GI tract sensory neurons in the GI tract also see some um, the, the receptors. I think it's also CB1, but I have to check with him. Another question I received is, so you basically think that nausea is something that is experienced in the brain, or is nausea experience basically in the rest of the body due to what these cells signal to you know the muscles and the whole like where do you think is it experienced basically that horrible feeling of nausea or because i thought this this question that i received was really interesting because if you think of it if you could just just disrupt maybe in the spinal cord <laughs> the signaling through some you know magnets um some stimuli you know there are so many devices right now out there where you can like stimulate your body your muscles whatever um if you could disrupt that shortly for like severe onset of nausea would that help do you think yeah. Yeah, so you're asking a great question that I would like to study in the future. So where, so what are the signals of nausea and where do they uh, get detected by what cells? And we know some of the neural pathways of, of a nausea, for example, the air postrema and potentially the vagus nerve. But 
they potentially connect, for, for example, the vagus nerve, they connect, it connect um, with the GI tract. Potentially, it could even communicate with local cells like macrophages or mast cells or some of these other cell types that initially detect signals of nausea. So um, I would like to understand the signals, which cells detect it, and then we can actually target those cell types um, and block it at even the peripheral site before it reaches the, the brain. The sensation of nausea is, is always in the brain, but we can um, you know, cut the signal transduction at different steps. Um, but we need to first understand what are those cells and what are those signals um, in different nausea conditions, for example, pregnancy or cancer chemotherapy or um, migraine. We, yeah, we, we really know too, too little. <laughs> Yeah, thank you uh, for answering all those questions. Um, I know we went a little bit over the hour. Um, you probably, um, you know, it's late for you. So we don't want to take too much more of your time. So if anyone has a last question, please go ahead. So, yeah, go ahead, Victoria. Yeah, thank you. Um, Chu Chu, I, I really just would like to thank you because even, even, if there are no definitive answers or solutions to to nausea that people are suffering currently, it's it's meaningful to hear it acknowledged and and see it acknowledged in this way. Um, Denise, you reminded me <clears throat> when you asked if there was another method, um, you know, a think method <laughs> um, to to combat nausea and and i'm not criticizing your you're suggesting this because definitely so many things are possible you know for example stimulating the vagus nerve in the face of panic and anxiety is is so effective and almost immediate it can be um but i want to i want to acknowledge that for women many of women's um symptoms that that women are tradition or conventionally our our complaints are ignored and so it can be very challenging for a woman to be believed and and find solutions and and one thing that I find found that very prevalent with was with morning sickness with pregnancy that Katarina said um, you know was so debilitating that she needed transfusions I avoided the hospital by um, you know by one blood test um, and and you're you're continuously told that it's in your head that there's something that you could think and you could think it away and and you know it's not true you know that it's that it's real and you're being rational but katarina you were mentioning that ptsd if if there was a possible link there there are two plants that i had in the house when i was first stricken with this morning sickness that lasted for months um and I cannot be in the presence of them without feeling nausea. And I will even forget that the connection is the pregnancy. And if I walk by them, I'll feel instantly sick. And, and so I, I am so curious what we will learn about that connection because all of those things, they're, those are real. Um, those reactions are real. They have information that we can glean someday. And, and um, so, Yes, my point is that it's it's important to honor what people are are complaining of. It's important to honor the symptoms and how important it is just that your research exists. That that is in itself honoring people's symptoms and suffering. So thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Um yeah, I can only agree to what Victoria said. And um, thank you, Chuchu, for coming here today. And we wish you all the best and all the luck and all the funding for your future lab. Um, I hope, you know, you get a wonderful offer, which you for sure will get because you did really elaborate, amazing work. And um, uh, once you have your new position and you start new research or whenever you want, please come back. But I uh, would be honored to have you back. Um, and um, yeah, thank you everyone for coming, asking questions, participating in the discussion. 
Um, and um, yeah, I hope everyone comes back again. And uh, I hope you enjoyed it too, too. And thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. It was fun. Um, hope to come back one day. <laughs> okay, yeah. And uh, then we can have a party for you, for your new lab. <laughs> Wherever it is, we are, you know, it doesn't matter. So we are always here. Um, okay, then. Uh, and yeah, if you like uh, discussions like this, uh, join the club, Science Society. We'll have more rooms like this in the future. We have our next room on Friday, and it's a um, quantum physics room with Dr. Vianes, um, who will talk about um, how um, a new discovery um, where they saw how electrons take fast and slow lane all at once, uh, which is really interesting. Um, and uh, we'll have on Monday Dr. Lumba um, talking about cognitive immobility in the mobile world, um, which will be a really interesting room about um, um, yeah, cognitive immobility. I think it, it's really interesting. And um, uh, then on Tuesday, we'll have Dr. Gross and Dr. Fallon talking about a magnificent mega bacterium he discovered and uh, about origins of life and um, uh, and we'll have many more rooms which I won't take up your time just you know follow the club and you'll see them and yeah thank everyone again have a great night morning um, wherever you are and uh, I hear you all back soon thank you thanks everyone Okay, I'll close the room in three, two, one. Bye, everyone. Thank Bye, you. Bye, thank you.